everyone, I'm Gauri Ganbir and today we are joined by Kavitha Krishnan to discuss the current situation of the ongoing Indian farmers protests. This is in lead up to our online celebration of Green Left's 30th anniversary on Saturday, March 27. We will be featuring supporters from around the world and how to get involved with Green Left. Our guest speaker will be Kavitha Krishnan, feminist and CPIML liberation leader. India is on the move for the rights of farmers and against privatization and corporate monopolies. There has been a mass movement which has started in 2020 and it has been generating solidarity from people across India as well as around the world, including Australia. Kavita is a leader of the Communist Party of India ML Liberation. She's a secretary of the All India Progressive Women's Association and a participant in the farmers' struggle against the Narendra Modi regime. Here at Green Left, we've been covering the farmers' protests. Uh, we've covered it through since November when they had the large um, 250 million people um, protesting throughout India. And we uh, covered the Republic Day protest. And in Perth, we even had um, solidarity protests from the Sikh, um, and Sikh Association and various Gurdars in support of um, the uh, farmers in Delhi. And so um, what we'd like to talk about today is to actually get a current update as to what is the current situation um, on the ground now in De Delhi with the farmers um, protesting. Um, so. Well, um, the situation is good. I mean, the protests are still strong. They are, um, you know, farmers are very determined that they will not um, go back. They will not end the protests until the three laws are repealed. Um, there is an issue right now, which is that uh, this is the harvesting season in Punjab. So farmers are having to take it in turns to go back and, um, you know, handle the harvest. Uh, there because basically there's very poor cold storage and so on in India. So, you know, as soon as you harvest, you also have to sell and all of that. So that is a massive job. But they are still uh, determined that they will uh, not vacate these protest sites. They will keep them going while uh, they also deal with their harvesting responsibilities and so on. So the protests are strong and they do enjoy a lot of public support, which is, I think, the key thing. So um, it is a protest which, uh, you know, enjoys a very large amount of support from people in India because um, most of, in, you know, almost, you know, a large majority of Indians, even those who live in urban places, have a relationship um, with uh, uh, farming communities and rural communities. Most migrant workers, for instance, in the cities actually come from villages, which we saw during the pandemic when they had to return. And so they were walking back to their villages. And uh, even, you know, middle class people, better off people usually will have some relation somewhere or the other uh, that has um, that continues to have a link with farming and with uh, farmlands. And so this is something that is an issue that people are able to understand, people are able to empathize with mm -hmm. quite easily. And I think this is what basically is spooking this government as well, because it's harder to delegitimize this more. And so with this, with the solidarity with, uh, with the farmers of the Indians, are, in, are Indian people, like just the ones that are not protesting, feeling the effects of the farmers being at the protest. I know you were saying that there's a harvesting issue. Are they, is there, is, are they feeling those effects? And how is, and as much as they're in solidarity, how much is that impacting the day-to-day -day life in India? Not really. See, okay. the, 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 the farmers are at the borders and that means that they are basically the protests are blocking certain uh, some of the roads from other states into Delhi. Right. Mm -hmm. But there are other roads. There are other ways of going. And the farmers are at those borders because they were not allowed to march to Delhi by the police 
which is something the police uh, doesn't you know when uh, people uh, when the police and the government go to the court and say that oh these farmers are blocking um, roads and they are creating a problem for um, people living in delhi and living uh, in those areas that's not true no one in delhi is suffering a lack of say milk supplies or vegetable supplies okay. or anything else because okay. of these protests and uh, as for people in the areas like in the farms lands near the protest sites they are participants in the protest so they are from haryana and uh, uttar pradesh and so on and they are participating they are farmers who are participating in the protest every day if you go uh, to the protest site then you will find that local people from haryana are coming to distribute vegetables distribute milk and so on um because they want to help the protests to sustain itself yeah. naturally food and uh, you know all of that is not coming from far away yeah. it's coming right from you know the farmlands which are neighboring the protest sites that's that's great to hear that there's so much solidarity and so much support um i was curious as to understanding um the role of the female farmers um and the up, I, i believe there will be an upcoming female farmer protest and how how these laws impact females uh farmers in particular um with women farmers you know the uh big issue has always been that they are rarely recognized as farmers even by existing laws even prior to these laws so the problem was that uh you know they are seen as um you know if they're husband commit suicide which you know farm suicides are a huge huge issue in india uh it becomes quite difficult for the other wife to actually prove that she is now the farmer that she runs the farm and that therefore she is entitled to whatever you know uh, subsidies or benefits which uh, a farmer may be entitled to uh so that has always been a problem there have been other issues as well um farm laborers in india the vast majority of them are women from oppressed castes most of them um and so women have a very close relationship with the farming uh, with farming and uh, naturally therefore they feel uh, the threat that if this whole farm infrastructure farm ecosystem becomes uh, goes into corporate control then essentially it will mean uh, that farmers and uh, will be at the mercy of uh, the corporations mm-hmm. and smaller farmers see the the government tries to tell everybody that you see it's only big farmers who are protesting small farmers are not protesting that's not true because um, government procurement you know the main issues which the farmers are seeing as being affected by these laws involve uh, two things one is that the government procures uh certain products especially rice and wheat which it then distributes as part of india's ration system mm-hmm. so a subsidized ra- food rations to the poor okay so that's one thing and then it procures these uh these crops at a minimum support price minimum support price is also fixed for certain other crops not all of which are procured by the government and uh, the farmer basically sells these crops in either a designated government run farmers market or outside in the open market uh the point is that where the government pro- does not procure there very often the farmer is forced to sell at a distressed price way below the minimum support price minimum support price is not enforced in india So the farmers want these three things they want a minimum support price to be ensured yeah. they fear that this these three laws are actually going to get rid of the very concept of a minimum support price at all even nominally yeah. even notionally and they fear that government procurement is going to stop because this these uh, basically and the and the farmers markets will be gone yeah. uh, and basically that will mean corporate control and corporations will be allowed to hold a whole lot of what are called essential food com- commodities in india which yeah. means they can skew the market prices and so on so this affects uh, the farmers of course but it also affects uh, it affects smaller farmers even far worse than bigger farmers yeah. who may still be able to take uh, you know take a little uh, up and down in uh, their uh, sale price and all of that yeah. it is the smaller farmers for whom government procurement is uh, even more important 
and that is why small farmers are protesting farm laborers are protesting as well because they know that this is something that will affect them as well their lives as well and um, women farmers are protesting in a big way the interesting thing is that uh, as i said women farmers tend to be the smaller farmers and they tend to be the farm laborers um the interesting thing is that um basically the court the supreme court started um trying to uh, act in a way to well uh, if i can use an impolite phrase sure. uh, say yes. save the government's backside basically yeah. <laughs> by um, you know saying that oh you know uh, well we will we are willing to mediate nobody asked you to mediate okay your job as a supreme court is only to say whether the laws are constitutional or not yeah. and nobody is even asking you to weigh in on that nobody approached the court from the farmers side yeah. um you you know the supreme court sort of jumped into this basically to help the government to rationalize um, you know something and the court order actually said so so the supreme court order in this matter said that oh uh, we said we want these laws stayed for uh, a certain period of time as in they will not be implemented for a certain yeah. period of time and we want this to be done in the hope that this may be uh, you know enough of us you know they didn't use these exact words but close enough to suggest that this will be enough to basically uh, allow the farm unions to save face and persuade their farmers to go back okay so you know a, a, a supreme court was giving this political logic in that same order and in that same hearing supreme court also said that women farmers you know, what are what you know why are women in these protests why are women being kept in these protests and uh, the chief justice of the supreme court said i'll take the risk of saying please send the women farmers back women farmers no he said just send the women back so then women basically protested on 18th of january uh, saying this is women farmers day and we are here to say that we are farmers we are women and we are farmers and we are our places in the resistance yeah. our and it is no one's business you know to keep us here or keep us there keep us at home keep us in the protest what is all this you know we are not things to be placed here and there and you are assuming that men have kept us here yeah. in the protest as a strategy and that is rubbish and they protested and they spoke about women farmers issues and they are planning that again towards 8th march and all of that so uh women farmers are making their voices heard uh they are part very much part of the leadership and of organizing as well uh having said that i will say that see uh you know these movements these are societies which are uh, rural societies in the delhi national capital region area uh, are very much macho societies you know and they are not societies in which um, feminist values are easily understood but in a way this movement is bringing a significant um, uh, you know uh, degree of change as well mm -hmm. in the very in that society as well because uh, men are doing roles like Uh, cooking and cleaning and so on on a regular basis on an everyday basis at the protest sites and uh, they are uh, feeling the need to uh, also see women farmers as uh, equals as leaders and all of that uh, and i think that that is also uh, you know remark one of the remarkable things that movements do yeah yeah, yeah it's it sounds like this is food and the availability of food and farming and it's a big it's a big uh um not question but a, a, an issue that br bring, has brought a lot of people together um and and basically I, like from what i've been reading is that not only has this brought together just humans and but also some political parties too to come to the side to the left to the pro progressive um agenda or not agenda but to 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 help the labor to help the workers so can you give me some background on um the CPIML movement and its involvement as well as some other political parties i know the congress party and some other small niche parties have started to support the farmers right Uh yeah that's that's very interesting actually because one of the talking points of the modi government is that oh you know why is the congress they're claiming that the opposition parties especially the congress are basically engineering the protests that the protests are not spontaneous they're not really farmers they're all political agents you know of the congress and so on 
uh, at the same time they say that congress itself was in support of similar policies similar farm laws uh, and uh, you know so modi is saying look i'm just taking the points which the, my predecessor also was in favor of he is not far off the mark there okay. when it comes to saying that the previous regime also was in favor of policies which were being pushed by the wto and uh, so on and these were policies which would have done away with farmers markets protected uh, you know with minimum support price with food rations and all of that so that's true but the point is that um, you know uh, why is the congress today taking a position in support of the farm movement it is precisely because the farmers you know nobody wants to be have the farmers for an enemy india is largely an agrarian country most of your voters have uh, you know are either farmers or farm laborers or have a relationship with rural india so you would not want to have and no government would want farmers as its enemy no ordinary government let me put it that which is why any party opposition parties which otherwise uh, you know it's not so much that they're coming around to a left wing agenda but more more to the uh, thing that because there are these enormous protests by farmers even gathering not just in delhi but say in uttar pradesh and so on huge farmers panchayats you know so farmers gatherings were large gatherings naturally political parties also feel the need to go and say okay we respect what you're saying perhaps we also may have passed similar laws if we were allowed to but we would have consulted you and if you are so opposed to it we would have changed our minds you know that is how democracies work that is how you know even if one doesn't have anything very good to say about the congress party this is how normal politics works right mm -hmm. that no government wants to do something yeah. which is going to alienate a significant voter base and so they're going to listen to what they're saying and back off right the modi government is different in this regard because they have a tremendous amount of money pouring in from very very large corporations an incredible amount of money especially from adani whom yeah. you you know listeners in australia viewers in australia will know about so uh, adani you know these are crony cap capitalist crony companies uh, that are in a very real sense close friends of narendra modi and uh, adani ambani and they are uh, through a system called electoral bonds these and other foreign as well as indian corporations can pour in money secretly they do not have to disclose how much money you know how much funding they are giving to this party and 95% of this electoral bonds kind of funding comes to the bjp and so the bjp is basically owned by these corporations yeah, yeah. and they owe something back these laws have been passed for those corporations and for none other and so for them to withdraw and backtrack on this is difficult that's the first thing the second thing is that politically this is a government that thinks very differently it uh, can it feels that it needs to project narendra modi as being above politics and you know as this you know above crit criticism and so you know he's taken a decision he's taken a decision it's like god's decision and so if you show that he is also vulnerable to political pressure like any normal political party or political government would be mm -hmm. then you are bringing him back into this you know the sphere of ordinary politics not this cult uh you know not this business of a cult figure not this fascist kind of yeah. dynamic yeah. you know you can't imagine hitler saying all right uh, oh there's this protest happening let me you know adjust uh, and no. uh, take, <laughs> you know take not, it on yeah. board yeah. right so that is the whole thing that you know this is a very different uh government therefore uh and it thinks very different for for it uh, for this regime the cult uh, image that they have invested in uh is something they cannot afford to lose okay. which is another reason why although they are worried about losing farmer support they feel okay we'll manage it we'll play some kind of hindu versus muslim card some islamophobic card and by the time elections come we'll be able to do some things so that we don't suffer for this policy i don't know if i answered your question uh very correctly but because i kind of lost track a little bit you know no, no yeah. th that's it's ex exactly kind of like yeah, yeah. the the influence of not you only asked about ml the ml you asked yeah, about yeah. the cpi ml that yeah. i did that's right so you know that explains why other opposition parties which otherwise may be on board with this kind of pro market kind of free market kind of policy are changing their minds because 
no one wants to eliminate farmer voter base. With the CPIML, you know, this is clearly these are positions that we have had for a very long time. We have been critical even of the so-called green revolution that happened in states like Punjab, where essentially a path of uh, uh, you know pesticide-intensive, capital-intensive farming was taken up, which was environmentally damaging, and which has trapped farmers in uh, that kind of a farming system. Where and there were other parts, other roads that could be taken. We've written about it on our website, and we can. Yeah. I would recommend that uh, you know people go and read if, uh, about uh, the farmers' movement and WTO if they want to read up a little bit more about what other paths could have been taken. Yeah. Um, but uh, what's happening now is that you know, the CPIML primarily has a base among uh, very small farmers in uh, north, northern India mm -hmm. and other parts of India, even southern India as well, and uh, small farmers and farm laborers. And so basically, uh, we are also a very uh, significant part of this movement. Our farm unions and farm laborer unions are very much part of this movement, um, both at Delhi's borders as well as in other states, um, and have been mobilizing, um, uh, you know, not only uh, been part of these protests, but also trying to mobilize among those who are, you know, strictly speaking, not farmers. So explaining the link between food rations, for instance, and these farm laws. Uh, our focus has been on that as well, to say that, look, if these farm laws are implemented, the government is going to go ahead with replacing food rations with cash, uh, cash, uh, you know, some sort of cash dole. Okay. And what happens is that food is something which, you know, you get and then you can consume if you're hungry. Mm -hmm. What happens with money is that it's a limited amount. Uh, you will s spend it on whatever. If somebody's sick in the family, you're going to spend it then. Mm -hmm. If somebody, you know, immediately it's going to get spent on something which is in more pressing need of that minute, that moment. And then for the rest of the month, you won't have food to eat, you know. Um, um, th there's that. And uh, of course, also suppose food prices in prices. the market, suppose they introduce food coupons. That's bad too, because what if the prices in the market go up very high, then your food coupon will not account for the price of it. Um, so we've been able to point that out. We've been able to point out the government's lies. And so we are getting support for that because we've been able to point out, for instance, that a senior minister in the Modi cabinet gave an interview to an English daily called the Indian Express, in which when he was asked, you know, why are these laws introduced? He said, oh, well, you know, one of the problems it's supposed to solve, these laws are supposed to solve is that the minimum support price that the government has to give is way higher than the market price in India as well as the international market price. That means that essentially the government is lying when it tells people and tells farmers that, oh, this is going to, these laws are going to help the farmers get a better price. Because a senior minister of your cabinet, while speaking to a sort of pro-market newspaper, um, got comfortable enough to say that, oh, it's a problem that we are having to pay a higher price and we want them to just get whatever price is in the market and that price is way lower right and this at a time when even the minimum support price is, does not support farming enough people have a hard time surviving on that price okay so these are things we've been able to point out we've been able to point out the policy basis of these things that these things are flowing from uh, the modi regime is serving corporate interests and wto interests and so things that we're not, you know, where um, sort of used to be left speak, like, oh, crony capitalism or uh, company Raj, you know, company Raj, company so Raj. the company's rule, yes. you know, uh, or Adani Ambani are, you know, deciding policies everywhere or, you know, go the media, which means that the media is basically in the lap of corporations and in the lap of the Modi government. They are basically pets of yeah. these. These are all things that suddenly are on everyone's lips. These are not, uh, you know, I'm not saying that is up, that is due to us, but I'm saying that the movement itself has, uh, you know, basically created so much awareness about this. In a way, it's a sort of Occupy Wall Street kind of mo yeah. moment here. Yeah, yeah. It's it seems like a very um, hi historic kind of moment in that um, you see. Like, or at least I see neoliberalism and Modi's kind of fascist policies kind of encap in slowly and even in rapidly encapsulating India. And, and I, I've, some people, you know, 
have said to me, oh, this is so, this will be so good. But really, it's a, for the workers, for the, for, you know, even for just for the middle class and the lower caste, all of these people, like these policies have, are, will, will, will not be benefiting them. And it's good Absolutely. that, yeah, and it's yeah. just so good. And the media will never tell them that. And it's so good that there's this knowledge is coming, pouring out. And I've, I've seen that um, when this knowledge comes pouring out, there seems to be backlash. There seems to be backlash against journalists, against activists. Um, and anyone who's right. kind of in opposition. Can you can you go detail into that a little bit more? Certainly, certainly. See, this government, again, uh, you know, the Modi regime, uh, well, uh, I'll just tell you first up about the latest. You mentioned, I think, um, you know, the uh, kind of international support that the farmers' movement has been getting. Mm -hmm. The very fact that uh, you in Australia are doing this interview with me means that you know, people in Australia are protesting. As you said, there have been solidarity yes. protests and so on. Now, um, uh, among the international support that was received, there was a tweet by uh, the pop star Rihanna, and there was a tweet by Greta Thunberg, and there was there were also tweets by, uh, you know, a British MP, uh, Kamda Harris's niece, Mina Harris, and so on and so forth. You know, so people who are, you know, who are well-known and um, can influence opinion, they tweeted in support of the farmers. Not surprisingly, really, because this is the largest uh, people's movement um, in a very long time, globally. So the fact that this movement should receive attention in sheer numbers and in sheer you know, sustainability, this movement is a very large, is a big deal. You know? So it is no surprise that people are talking about it. But um, this government uh, has been pre pretty rattled by this international support. And they have also, you know, Greta Thunberg tweet, tweet, tweeted out a link to a toolkit. So a toolkit is basically, you know, of course you know that and I know that, but I'm just saying it for anyone who may not know, that a toolkit is basically something which, you know, basically every, you know, our activism uses it and they have one or the other word for it. But essentially it is something which you put together so that you're able to, you know, distribute it, disseminate uh, information, first thing. So there'll be a brief, uh, uh, you know, write up about what are the key issues, what's the history of this issue, what is being demanded, and um, why it's important, right? And then you basically uh, also explain, okay, if you're convinced about these issues, what can you do? So what can you do? They they tell you what you can do if you want to get involved, right? So they tell you, okay, uh, you know, at the very least, you could tweet about it and use this hashtag. You could post about it and use this hashtag. Or you could, um, you know, make a video, or you could tell others, and you could mobilize a protest, etc. Simple. Now, the you know the government is using that tweet and that Google document as a proof of an international conspiracy, uh, and they are saying that the young people, young climate change activists who work with Fridays for Future in India, are basically uh, that they were conspiring to commit sedition against the Indian state. They were conspiring to, uh, uh, you know, incite violence, um, uh, you know, and uh, basically, uh, you know, incite farmers against the Modi regime, against the government, against the state, and so on and so forth. So basically, what they're doing is to equate a very ordinary advocacy of democratic, non-violent yeah. resistance and protest with sedition. And this is not the first time they're doing. So the Modi regime has its own toolkit. Um, basically, which has been pretty similar, that they have responded to student movements, they have responded to Dalit movements, they have responded to the movement against the Citizenship Amendment Act, which was uh, threatening to disenfranchise, which which would which um, which will end up disenfranchising yes. Muslims. Um, so there were huge protests last year against that, and now they're responding to the farmers' protests with the same template. What they're doing is that they pick on something which is very innocuous, like a WhatsApp group. You know, if you are campaigners, if you're organizers of protests, you know that people are likely to communicate with each other in a WhatsApp group, in a Telegram group, in a Signal group, whatever, some kind of group, right? So you use a WhatsApp group or you, you say so and so people met at this place, there's a meeting. And then they give a connotation of 
conspiracy on and using the media since they almost all of indian big media is basically pro modi media it is a uh, nasty propagandist it spreads hate speech against muslims against activists you name it mm -hmm. so they have that you know propaganda machinery with them um and they then disseminate they give this whole air of conspiracy to something that is very ordinary uh and say oh you know the very fact that all these diverse people are part of a whatsapp group, the very fact that a whole lot of diverse people from diverse movements met you know had a meeting to discuss how to support a protest means that they're conspirators and they were conspiring to you know against the government and therefore against the state so protest is conspiracy organizing the very word organize is seen as i got you you are organizing and that means that you are committing you know conspiracy yeah. against the state yeah. um that's the same thing they're doing in this case yeah. and uh, yes you're right they've gone after journalists they've gone after uh far they filed cases against farmers leaders uh supporters of farm movements a uh, young they've arrested these young climate change activists and it's going to go on and on and uh the problem is that the safeguards you know they're supposed to be constitutional safeguards yeah, yeah. so ideally what you need is for a court to step in and say that hello you know you can't do that this toolkit uh is uh, uh not grounds for arrest and it's rubbish you cannot begin to arrest people based on this uh a whatsapp group is not grounds for arresting anyone you can't do that you know and um but they use basically a law in sedition law of course as well as another law called the unlawful activities prevention act mm -hmm. i want your listeners to really listen carefully to this bit because this law uapa is something they've souped up in it's always been a draconian law even in the previous congress governments and so on but they've souped it up the bjp regime the modi regime has souped up that law so that under this law any individual can be declared a terrorist based on nothing so and if the you know any flimsy cock and bull uh, tale can be spun about anyone the government wants to target and they can have you they can name you in a police case uh, invoking this law and as soon as they invoke this law um basically the person can be held in jail without bail and without trial indefinitely there are people in jail right now who have been in jail for more in prison when i say jail i mean prison so prison um for more than 3 years right now labor um organizers labor lawyers uh you know intellectuals um uh, you know senior citizen poets a poet who is over 80 years old um and from there till young women feminist activists and young muslim activists and so on you name it so there's a whole range of people who are arrested now what you need as a constitutional safeguard is also for a court to say see what courts have done is suppose somebody is uh, accused and the case against them says oh they were part of this whatsapp group they were part, part of conspiracy they did this so the court looks at it and says nonsense it has happened in delhi with the delhi riot cases of last year where young feminist activists have had court say what nonsense you know you have to give bail in this case because clearly this person has not uh, you know incited anyone to commit violence this is ordinary protest and they have a right then the police brings in this uapa law yes. and after that the courts kind of say oh oh it's uapa so well the law does not allow a judge to form an opinion about the content of the case what we need is for judges to have this final word to be able to say no you know our job is not defined by the law our job is defined by the constitution we are supposed to decide if this law is constitutionally applied or not and we have every right to do that and we should be saying this we should be granting bail and saying that you know you cannot do this unfortunately uh, that has not happened and that shows the extent to which uh, you know in a way arundhati roy is right when she says they have already stormed our capital yeah. and it's over you know yeah. they have won in a sense because they you know all the constitutional institutions are now very largely in their grip you know uh the only bits of hope in india are movements like the farmers movement yeah. and other you know places where people are determined to mobilize without being 
divided into Hindu versus Muslim or Hindu versus Sikh. And they are insisting on, and the hope also lies in young people who are willing to speak out even at such uh, terrible costs. You know. Yeah. Oh, uh, another thing I should tell you is tell your listeners is the WhatsApp chats between one of the women arrested and purportedly between one of the women arrested in Greta Thunberg are being aired. You know, cl clearly the police have taken her phone uh, again. You know, without any warrant, nothing. You know, they have not. They they arrested her. Plain clothes policemen came to her house from Delhi. She lives in yeah. Bangalore. So these are two completely different jurisdictions. This is Disha. They come yeah. in. Disha Ravi. Yeah. Yeah. They walk into her house. Uh, she lives with her mother. And they say, all right, uh, we're taking your daughter away for questioning. And then they take her away in plain clothes. No warrant, no nothing. Uh, and uh, they disappear with her. So her mother is not informed. Her father is not informed. Her lawyers are not informed where she is. Mm -hmm. And then the Delhi police basically quietly hush hush bring her away to Delhi. Again, this is not completely illegal, completely yeah, unconstitutional. Yeah. You can't take someone out of jurisdiction without a lawyer, without a judge's order. And so they do that. They produce her before a magistrate without a lawyer present. She doesn't have a lawyer. The magistrate doesn't look at this and say, oh, she doesn't have a lawyer. So either call her lawyer or let me appoint a state appointed lawyer. No, the magistrate said, all right, take her into police custody for five years. It is a scandal the way that this has happened. Yeah. And this woman's WhatsApp chats then, which are clearly, the police is leaking. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But they're leaking it to the to channels which I described earlier, yeah. uh, which are basically these propaganda arms of the government. And these are WhatsApp chats in which she is telling Data Tunberg, oh, you tweeted the toolkit out, you know, based on this uh, communication based on that toolkit that we prepared, uh, it's quite possible I'll get arrested under the UAPA. She wasn't wrong, was she? Yeah, you know? she was not wrong. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so the what if that WhatsApp chat is true, it's really, uh, you know, it, it incriminates not her, but the government, the regime, that what yeah. she was saying was absolutely spot on, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it just sounds like a, at any chance that this the Modi the fascist Modi government can get they are trying to suppress the people I mean this law in itself sounds to me like a a law to just it could be any they can construe anything then as some any any kind of oppositional words they could construe into anything even and even you know um, like freedom of speech, freedom of protest, all of those things are just thrown thrown away. And this is this is the rise of fascism. And and I guess the like what is to be. Ex I mean, we we already know the courts, the corporations, the all of the systemic infrastructure has been taken over by the BJP, by Modi, by fascists. What 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 is to be expected going forward do you know how can how can india overcome this um well, i think that you know uh i keep telling myself and reminding myself that uh, you know there is this i think the farmers protest surprised yes. stuff yeah all right so the point is and last year's protests against which were led by muslim women but in which a whole lot of young people participated against a law that was primarily anti-Muslim, yeah. but was also against India's poor and all of that. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was threatening to form citizenship registers and have the government decide who is a citizen and who isn't based on what documentation you could show about whether your grandparents and great grandparents were citizens yes. or not. Yeah. Right? I think the, 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 gov the government was surprised by the kind of support that movement received. They're surprised by the farmers movement. And uh, so it's important, I think, for anyone, anyone invested in India's democracy and India being a democracy in Indian people. And by democracy, I don't mean, OK, just voting and, you know, formal parliament and all of that. I actually mean the right to protest, mm -hmm. the right to free speech and all of this. And then these are not just liberal rights. These are rights which uh, we know that when they are, you know, they're there in the Constitution, they're on, they're on paper. But what activists like us do on the left is basically to fight for the right for that to actually be translated into a right that everyone can actually access and 
assert, right? Mm -hmm. And that is difficult to yeah. do. That's exactly what class is and all of that. So the, you know, if you want it to be a democracy where activists can still do their work to try and change society, that's what I mean by democracy. Mm -hmm. Anyone invested in that has to, I think, believe in people, has to believe that people are not already, you know, yes, this is India's 1930s Germany moment, but it is not already a lost cause. Um, it is, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, a there are a large number of Indian citizens. Yes, the Hindu uh, supremacist ecosystem is much louder. It has a lot more money. It has a lot of influence uh, in all kinds of you know, places and all of that. But, um, you know, in people's minds and hearts, it is not, they haven't yet won that battle irrevocably. Okay. So I think that I draw my hope from there and I therefore think that we need to keep fighting back. And um, I see how rattled they are by the fact that young people uh, in, a, in a BJP ruled state, okay, uh, let me tell you something, for instance, that this Disha Ravi's arrest. Well, today, uh, you know, these, these, uh, the BJP basically has these um, social media warriors, these, these armies of trolls who trend, uh, you know, divisive, uh, hateful topics and all of that. So they, they and th for that, they have toolkits huh? yeah. on which if you, you know, documents on which if you click it, you immediately the tweet is ready and you tweet it we, uh, to the, F F uh, to the, uh, degree that even ministers tweet the same thing, like word for word, copy paste, copy paste. Uh, cricketer, cricketers will say, tweet the same thing. So very much a toolkit and all of that, hateful stuff. Um, in fact, some people have had uh, fun by joining these groups and slightly editing the document. Uh, to, you know, for instance, one uh, fact-checking uh, portal called Alt News. Some a uh, couple of years back, they went and edited one of. So. I guess, where were we? We were basically talking about what's to expect being expected going forward and what has the, with the backlash happened with, um, you know, with um, Disha Ravi and just how, I think we were talking about how they took her from her home, how we're, yes, so yes, let's, yes. we can just go, go on from there. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes. So basically they uh, violated every uh, rule in the book and every law every uh, piece of the constitution and now they're trying to say on uh, uh, Twitter that uh, you know the top trend in India is Disha Ravi Jacob. So they're trying to say that her real name is Disha Ravi Jacob which means she's Christian. Um, yeah. So what right? Yeah. So what so, so right? What? Yes. So uh, they're, they're saying the they're, they're, they're Disha Ravi is something or the other. I think uh, you know Disha Ravi um, Joseph, sorry, they're saying the Sharavi jo Joseph is her name and so she's Christian. So what, right? Mm -hmm. Nikita Jacob, another woman who was arrested, she's gotten bail today. She's Christian. So what, yeah, you so know, what, yeah. whether someone is Christian or not, why should that matter? But then that's the whole thing that they keep trying to use bigotry to justify the authoritarianism, to say that she is less deserving of your solidarity or um, less deserving of your outrage um, at the illegal and unconstitutional manner um, you know, in which she's being deprived of her rights because she's Christian, because she's Muslim, because some these. So that's the uh, whole thing that they keep doing this. Um, it tells you something about uh, what things are like here. But going forward, I think that we have to keep, uh, you know, refuse to be um, distracted and use of every occasion to basically tell people about how this thing can come to your door tomorrow, you know. I'm told by um, uh, people in Bangalore that actually Disha's own parents, mother especially, uh, father also probably, that they were, that they voted for Narendra Modi, that they thought that the BJP was a good party and a good idea to vote for them. And that they are surprised that uh, this has happened. They are shocked by it. And I think that um, very gently, I think, you know, the, it is time to tell people that, look, um, even if you lack the empathy to think, oh, you know, voting for the BJP, what is it going to mean for India's minorities? And if you're a Hindu and you think, oh, this is a Hindu first party and I'm Hindu, so, you know, it'll work for me at least. So what if it doesn't really, you know, if it, if it does a little persecuting of Muslims? Right. 
but the whole point is that no uh, it is not a hin it's not a party that's going to work for hindus either yeah. it is using hindu supremacy in the majoritarianism as a politics in order to get its grip a totalitarian grip a dictatorial grip over the country yeah. and over you it's going to come to your door as well you know so yeah. um i know one shouldn't have to say that one should but the point is that i think well one does in india because you can't count on uh, the empathy and you know the natural empathy which a human being should have for another irrespective of what prejudices you know you are fed against yeah. various kinds of minorities but um you know yeah yeah i mean oh. it's it's a, it's a really like you know no one w- wants to compare this anything to what happened in the 1940s to germany and what hitler did but the same strategies are kind of being used all over in order to uh, in the pursuit of a neoliberal you know corporatist um strategy to basically make a subservient working class and and basically serve the needs of these rich people and hopefully when workers come together like these in these protests that this we can all you know spread the message that this um this is not the world that we'd like want to live in right 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 so um yeah i mean yeah yeah <laughs> so um so yeah that's just you know i am i'm so i feel so privileged and so lucky to be able to interview you uh miss christian and Pleasure. and um it has been so great to talk to you and i really look forward to 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 joining um yeah. you in our yeah. eco socialist conference that we will be having yeah, sure. thank you so much thank you yeah. yes <laughs>